Hey, Joey, I just want to know if you're worried that you won't be allowed to enter Russia after releasing this podcast. Good question. Um, I could kill you quite easily, but I don't because I'm not a killer. I was banging on the door and the first thing he said, where are the documents? Do you want to know more? Me? Mm. Yeah. Welcome to Nest of Traders Declassified. I'm Claire Weaver, Investigations Editor at Listener, and today I'm joined by creator and host of Secrets We Keep, Season 2, Nest of Traders, Joey Watson. Hey, Claire. Hi, Joey. So, tell us about what we're doing today. Okay, this is the part of the podcast. It's not a part of the podcast. This is a addition to the podcast where we get together in the studio and we talk a little bit more about spycraft the world of deception, my hunt to find the mole that betrayed Australia that has brought me towards the brink of insanity and stuff that didn't make it into the podcast and we have listener questions and uh, we have a nice time. Episode one is already out. Um, today we're going to talk about episode two. Um, so in this episode we meet three new characters um, and the first is Swamp. So what can you tell us about Swamp. Um, sure. Swamp is, um, I can tell you some things about Swamp, but I can't tell you too much about Swamp because as you'll uh, learn in the podcast or as if people have already heard it, as they've already heard in the podcast, um, we protect his identity. We even use a voice actor. Um, why did you have to do that? Um, because it's illegal under the ASIO Act, section 92 of the ASIO Act, which has been drilled into my head, um, uh, makes it illegal to, um, identify a, an ASIO officer, even a retired ASIO officer without authorization. There are some technicalities to the legislation, but, um, we thought that we'd play it safe. Also, he's, um, kind of putting himself out there and telling me things that, um, would, that potentially the Australian government and ASIO don't doesn't want known. Um, so it also gives him a level of secrecy in all journalism. And I think especially in the world of intelligence journalism, I was told this very early on and I've held it closely. Source protection is crucial. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Swamp is not his real name. So Swamp is not, <laughs> he, was not he was not christened Swamp <laughs> with no surname, <laughs> like, uh, 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 like Madonna. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Swamp is uh, not his um, real name. It was a code name that we worked out together. Um, I had some concerns about it because it, it brought up images of Shrek, mm -hmm. which is not really the direction I wanted, you know, like. Get out of my swamp. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really the direction that I saw this podcast going in. Um, but 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 it, over time, it seemed to work. And I guess it's like that with names. It just That's just how I identify him now. That's how people refer to him. Um, but, but anyway, who is he? He is a long-serving ASIO employee. He spent a lot of time in his career dealing with counterintelligence. And counterintelligence is very important to this story because that's the um, area of spycraft that deals with protecting and attacking um, the opponent's spy agency. So the spy games that are played between spy agencies are usually referred to as counterintelligence, as opposed to counterespionage, which should be more like keeping spies out of the cities and streets of of the of of the country that. You're, you're protecting, or, or you know, if that kind of makes sense. Counterintelligence, we're actually talking about the spy agency. Yep. And Swamp uses some quite colourful language, which we'll, we'll hear a bit of. The idiot that I was with was wearing a green pork pie hat and a Burberry overcoat. Those who covered him directed operations against him. They were a bunch of fuckwits. Uh, yes, um... Swamp, like many, many spies I've spoken to, um, doesn't hold back. Um, he's absolutely emphatic um, in what he thinks about ASIO during this period, but possibly more so than any other spy I spoke to um, or any former spy I, I spoke to. Um, he has a knack for words. He speaks in incredible poetry, um, which made him brilliant for uh, the podcast because not only was he in the right places at the right time to give me information that could help me in my mole hunt, he was also really, really good at telling me that information um, using uh, colourful language and metaphor. And, yeah. Yeah. And he describes this atmosphere of distrust. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Sure. So the, the setup of this 
episode is that Swamp tells me what well, we spent a little bit of time talking about um, the realities of Spycraft, what ASIO actually did. I, 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 that was what I wanted to learn from Swamp, and I think that that was important to set the scene for the podcast. But the um, point where it becomes interesting is um, I learned that in 1980, um, so this is now a 10-year backtrack from where we finished in the last episode, which all happened in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War in the early 90s. That's when ASIO... Um, and the AFP set up Operation Liver. That's when they went after George Sedil, that, uh, that, that trial that ultimately failed. So now we're going back 10 years to 1980 because that's when ASIO got a tip-off um, that a KGB spy who had been stationed in Australia for s- seven years during the 70s had received an Order of the Red Star, a medal in Moscow, um, which is like... Uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a defense medal. It's a, it's a, uh, the Soviets loved medal systems. It's prestigious. Uh, it's, it's very, very yeah. prestigious. He received this, this medal and specifically the intelligence that ASIO had received was that uh, he'd received the medal for a successful recruitment within Australian intelligence that he had during his tenure in Australia, he'd been based out of the Soviet embassy in Canberra under diplomatic cover. He had recruited at some stage a mole. And um, the tip-off, which came from a defector named Oleg Gordievsky, um, who has a long and complicated story in his own right. Um, there's a great book about Gordievsky called The Spy and the Traitor, written by Ben McIntyre, um, which goes into... Uh, he was possibly the most important and influential mole of the Cold War. But anyway, for, for our story, the tip-off said that it didn't um, specifically label that the spy had come from ASIO, or that the mole had been in ASIO, but everyone in ASIO, according to Swamp and according to other spies, ASIO spies that I spoke to who aren't in the podcast, everyone started to look over their shoulder. Right. Everyone started to suspect that the spy might have been within ASIO. So, and this recruiter is the second character in this episode, um, and that's Geronti Lazovic. Yes, Geronti Lazovic. He was a KGB spy who had been stationed in Canberra for six years from around 1971 to 1977. And Swamp's quite critical of ASIO itself and, and presumably how it handled this episode. That, uh, that's right, and particularly retrospectively. So I spent a lot of time going through um, the files that ASIO had collected on Geronti Lazovic. Um, so ASIO files are records of, of years and years of comprehensive surveillance of anyone that ASIO declared to be a person of uh, in interest. And a lot of them had now become publicly available. And sometimes they're on Australian citizens that might be a threat to the state. Sometimes they are on, um, or more often, the more comprehensive ones, are surveillance of uh, Russian diplomats or Russians operating in Australia who they suspect might be doing espionage, might be a KGB spy. So I went through this... Um, these very extensive files. Um, there was like 16 volumes plus extra. There were two huge tubs full, which I got from the National Archives. And I started to see that the surveillance of this guy who had won this medal in Moscow when he'd returned after being in Australia was substandard. Um, it was kind of vague. The analysis wasn't overly pointed. Um, they did know that he was a KGB spy, but it looked like they had just sort of learned that from overseas. Some, someone, some, somehow they'd picked up some information that he was a KGB spy overseas. They, they didn't really catch him in the act in any way whatsoever. And I realized that they weren't a particularly good resource for me trying to find the mole. And then I spoke to Swamp about that. And he, in the 1980s, after the, the, the tip off that I'd just spoken about, Um, after learning that ASIO had been penetrated, he then went through the files as well. And he came to, had already come to a very similar conclusion to me back then. And that's when he starts to sort of fire off a little bit about ASIO. And did he see it uh, more as kind of ineptitude or um, that there wasn't motivation or was it sabotage? Why? Why was this substandard? Yeah. Well, why why can't we have both? I think... um, the obvious and easy explanation is that there were problems within ASIO at the time. And um, I do go further to explore them in the next few episodes. Um, there were pretty fundamental systemic issues um, that were exposed. But Swamp then sort of starts to suspect that something 
um, might have been up when I start probing as to why these files were so bad. Yeah, maybe mm. something was wrong within the organization. For example, maybe it had been penetrated. Maybe there was a mole. Right, from within. Yeah. So you describe how you're going through all these surveillance files um, and some of that detail is super granular. Um, and just to give everyone an idea of that, we're going to play you a clip. There are heaps of incredibly boring transcripts of conversations Lazovic had. Like in one, Lazovic calls his wife and says, Dahlia, did you call? Jera, we did not buy any milk. Are you on your way home? You might buy some. I thought we had some. No, they drank it all. Well, we'll buy. I'll drop in and buy some. Being a spy isn't always the James Bond action pack stuff you might hope for. Sometimes it's milk. Sometimes it's milk. But it's good to know that, you know, even though he was potentially recruiting um, the spy that would possibly bring ASIO down from the inside, he was recruiting an Australian traitor that his family life in Canberra seemed to be quite content. Um, the milk operation went off, it sounds like, without a hitch. There was no tension about whose responsibility it was to buy the that's milk. That's right. Yeah. So that's really nice. It's really nice to know. Cereal, coffee, tea, everything was all sorted. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. But there is a lot of that. A lot of that sort of material, you know, which is taken from ASIO phone taps. Um, it'd be quite a boring job. Yeah. I mean, if, first glance, you think, oh, it'd be exciting, but actually. Yeah, it's meticulous. It's, um, I think, Swamp uses the metaphor, it's flies in horse pucky. <laughs> What's horse pucky? I don't know. I thought you might know. <laughs> <laughs> it's horse poo, right? Maybe. Pucky? Pucky. Um, yeah, it's like taking a huge amount of information collected in the field mm. or through phone taps and then trying to look for something. But mm. um, ultimately, in all of these phone conversations that are transcribed um, throughout the ASIO files for Lazovic, um, and the surveillance of him in the field, even things like family holidays that to the south coasts of New South Wales and stuff like that. There wasn't really anything um, that would emphatically show that he was um, conducting espionage in Australia, let alone recruiting a mole. Um, there was one thing I read. He, he would have regular meetings um, with a guy named John Wilton Brown, who was quite a well-known Australian communist figure. And the reason for those meetings, at least the way, what it looks like it was in the ASIO file, um, was to organize like photographs for exhibitions that would show what it was like in the Soviet Union. And in those meetings, there are elements of at least an awareness of like espionage like activities. Like there's one line because they would meet around King's Cross in Sydney, um, which uh, at the time, less so now, but at the time was particularly famous as a, as a red light district. And um, Asia recorded him saying something to John Wilton Brown being like, aren't the girls nice? Um, what a shame that they're all, um, that, that many of them would be undercover um, intelligence officers or something like that right. or something like that. And I felt like that was really, really juicy, but um, mm. it doesn't really go anywhere. It just mm. looks like a sort of throwaway comment. Yeah. Um, and it certainly doesn't Could have give... even been an ASIO joke. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Like it's a, yeah, 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 yeah. Journalists make those sorts yeah, of jokes exactly. all, the, all, all the time. See, when you first showed me that milk transcript, I remember thinking, right, milk's a code for something, right? What, what's milk? <laughs> like, you know? No, it's just... No, it was just a domestic conversation. Mm. And yeah, and it was like pretty exhausting. Like it's a lot of material to go through. Mm. Um, I thought that I should do it. Um, you, you know, if I wanted to be forensic, it was important mm. to follow every lead to its fullest extent. But it was a lot of investment. And it felt a little bit um, frustrating to mm. have found nothing. Yeah. After going through all of that. Yeah. It gives you an appreciation of the work, I suppose. That's that true. Do. That's true. It is really, really difficult work. Mm. Um, intelligence. It's extremely difficult. And I imagine now with the um, capabilities they have to collect information today, it would possibly be even more overwhelming trying to create meaning Absolutely. in the amount of material the volume. that intelligence yeah. agencies would be able to gather. So can you tell me about how you approached uh, Geronti Lazovic? Did you really try to slide into the DMs of a former KGB spy? <laughs> yeah, I tried. Right, you've got to try everything in this business, right? But um, 
<laughs> Look, I found him on social media. That was the only place I could find him. But in this situation, it wasn't his social media. He's um, well in his 90s. I saw a picture of him on a community Facebook page. Um, uh, sorry, a community page called uh, on a on a Russian Facebook page. Russians Russia's Facebook is called Vkontakte. Facebook is banned in Russia, um, so this is the Russian equivalent. But I did find a um, a picture of him with his wife. It looks like two younger kids. He's a very old man, much older looking than um, the kind of handsome young guy that was in the ASIO files um, that that was photographed so methodically in the ASIO files. And he. Uh, Anyway, so I, I I found an email address associated with that that Vikontakta page and um, tried to message him or tried to get in contact with him. But I knew it would be extremely difficult because the situation in Russia makes it really, really hard for journalists to get in. Plus, it was apparent from the Facebook post that he is still a Soviet-style patriot. Right. Um, so there are some KGB people out there who are critical of Russia privately sometimes publicly, um, and they bring danger to themselves by being like that. But it was clear that like he was the deputy of some veterans group but, um, that was localized in that area of Moscow. And so it was, an op- it was like a, 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 an attempt. It was the sort of best avenue of inquiry that I had, but no, it didn't go anywhere. He didn't reply, right. which is why I was sort of just left with the files to piece together what he had done when he was in Australia. Do you have any idea of what was missing in the 19 manila folders on Lazovic? Um, no, I have absolutely no idea. And you sounded quite defeated in the episode when you spoke about this. Yeah, well, I spoke to you about it because that's w- you are where I go to whinge. <laughs> I'm your sounding about, board. About things. When I learned that 19 of, the, of Lazovic's manila folders, that of ASIO's um, manila folders chronicling Lazovic's time in Australia had disappeared, and that the 17 files that I had sorted through at the National Archives in Canberra were barely, I mean, not quite even half of the, the picture. Um, I obviously started to wonder whether maybe the juicy stuff had been in the other files. But I will say, yeah, when I learned that, as you know, I was extremely disappointed uh, and extremely upset and extremely shocked. But over time, I learned that this was not uncommon. ASIO files did sometimes go missing. Um, one of the findings of a Royal Commission um, into ASIO, which we'll talk about in the next couple of episodes, was that ASIO's record management system was completely haphazard and disorganized. And so what looked like a huge conspiracy at the time, I started to think that maybe it was a result of incompetence um, or just like bad systems, the bad systems that were in place. But it left me in the same position that I didn't have access to Lazovic because he's a Russian patriot and the situation in Ukraine made it, makes it extremely difficult. And the files that I did have to sort of try and construct a vision of what his time was like in Australia when he supposedly recruited a mole in Australian intelligence, or at least the tip-off was that he had won a medal for recruiting a mole in Australian intelligence, was, was uh, less than half the picture. It's pretty disappointing. Yeah. I can see why you were defeated. Yeah. And the third person that we hear from in this episode is Oleg Kalugin. So for those um, of our listeners who haven't heard about Oleg Kalugin, how big of a deal was it that the former director of the KGB spoke publicly on Australian television? Yes, in 1994 is when that um, particular tape is from. Um, I mean, it's a moment that sort of was only made possible by unimaginable sweeps in human history. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, um, there was, as that was happening, there was like a a KGB-led coup to try and bring the state back under KGB control and try and um, retain what there was left of the Soviet Union. Um, Many um, KGB men felt resentful of the fact that the Soviet Union had fallen. Many of them wanted a return to the sort of authoritarian um, style politics that had defined their lives and their existence for generations. Um, one of them is a guy named Vladimir Putin, who uh, you might have heard of. Um, he was, of course, a former KGB man, and I think was typical of that sort of resentful politics that um, had created the Russia that we we know today. Uh, but Oleg Kalugin was the opposite. He had been a uh, KGB. 
um, director, um, a sort of rising star. He'd spent some time in America, but had been promoted extremely quickly. Um, he'd had some successful recruitments when he was in the U.S., um, and he was sort of like, at the fall of the Soviet Union, he sort of started, had to start answering questions about that. But yeah, he, he was a real KGB guy. But for whatever reason, as the Soviet Union fell and the Russian Federation was born in the early 90s, he decided... The window of opportunity? Yeah, he, 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 he decided that he was really into democracy and he had great hopes for a um, democratic Russia. He'd even run in the very loose Russian elections that happened um, in the immediate aftermath of the fall. He'd even um, run on a ticket in a, for, for a pro-democracy party. Um, but that was not the Russia that was to be. He, he now lives in America, uh, in Washington. Um, he claims he's not a defector, um, although some people in the intelligence world would define him otherwise. I think in Russia, they, they especially would. But anyway, he now lives his life in Russia. But anyway, it was only in those conditions that he would write a book, a memoirs that would sort of detail his many, many years in, um, in intelligence. And it was full of different kinds of revelations. But one of them um, was that uh, the KGB had effective moles in Australia um, that's what he says in the book. And was and, that the revelation on television as well that and, he made? And that's how he came to be on Australian television, talking, oh, right. being, being probed about the book, um, being probed about his time in the KGB and being probed about the mole in Australia. And he gives all sorts of kind of descriptive details uh, around a particular case. He says that they offered their services in the 70s. Um, he, or he says, yeah, that was roughly in the 70s, something to that effect. He says that they had self-offered their services. They'd started um, in the mail, but then had moved to uh, dead dead letter drops, which are like where you just leave things at secret, like, like pre-agreed locations um, surreptitiously and, and then go and collect things after they've been there. And, and yeah, and so that's, that's how he came to be on Australian TV. But the most important thing of that interview and, and the thing that I really took from it is that he hypothesized that there was more than one. He figured that the quality of the intelligence that they were getting um, indicated to him that it was potentially plural, that there was um, more than one mole within ASIO. Hence and, nest of traders. Hence nest of traders. And I, I, I then kind of get caught up in that lead and that carries the investigation over the next few episodes. And how explosive was that idea that it wasn't just this one bad egg, that multiple moles were operating within ASIO? Um, I think it would have been, I, I think it was extremely explosive at the time. And I think it was a very important interview. This is in the immediate aftermath of the trial of George Sedil. Um, I think at that stage, ASIO would have liked the story to be buried. You'll remember that George Sedil was not successfully prosecuted. And I, I, I think at this stage, it would have been convenient if the whole thing could have just sort of been paved out. There were things happening internally within ASIO and within the government that we'll learn about in later episodes um, to um, kind of deal with the problem as quietly and with as, li with as little mess as, as possible. Uh, but uh, this, I mean, you could not get more public than a former director of the KGB. It's like, it would have just been like, okay, now we've got a big story on our hands. And I think many people that have followed the story since then, um, me being the last one, um, a lot of it comes back to the revelations of Oleg Kalugin and sort of trying to piece together who the mole might have been, who the moles might have been um, from the clues that were scattered throughout that interview and, and in his book. And why do you think he did it? Is it was it his em, em, embracing democracy and transparency? Was he showing off? What what do you think prompted him to do that interview and reveal these details? Um, I don't know, but it wasn't uncommon for Russians uh, and particularly KGB people who had whether they defected or not, and there's a little semantic argument over that. Whether who ended up in America um, to write books uh, and start giving interviews and start giving lectures about their time in the KGB. Um, maybe if you wanted to be um, cynical, you could say there was a lot of money in at that time. There's a lot of interest in what had gone on um, at that kind of juncture in history where there seemed to be a, a ceasing in hostilities and a, a 
and, and a coming together. Um, people wanted to learn about the secret world that had kind of hovered over the West for the last 40 years before that. But then also maybe there was something ideological. I mean, he was became really critical of the organization that he had led. And maybe there was an element of that in it as well. So in this episode, we heard about an ASIO spy who was trying to seduce a KGB spy. Um, so the mission failed, but have you heard about any other sex stories? Um, I mean, there are sex stories laced throughout the history of espionage. I think it was only a couple of years ago, um, maybe even a year ago, that Mike Burgess in his uh, annual threat assessment had said that now people um, like people in Canberra were being recruited on Tinder and other dating websites um, by, by foreign intelligence. He wasn't obviously talking about, he wasn't showing his cards. He wasn't saying whether or not ASIO was doing the same thing. But I think the line he gave was like, if you're a, f- if you're a four and there are 10, then start asking questions or something, <laughs> something like that. Maybe we can get that up. I don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it was clear that in the Cold War that spy agencies would do anything that they can get, that anything that they could to try mm. and get information on the other, on the other, from the other side. And, um, yeah, like in this case in particular, sex was part of that. Yeah. And there's actually a long history, isn't there, of sex and romance being used as a tool. Yeah, in absolutely. The, the term honey trap is thrown around quite a lot. Um, yeah, mm. you, you, you seduced in and then you get stuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could put one thing back into this episode that was taken out, what would it be? Uh, well, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, um, uh, an ex- there was an extremely raunchy sex scene that Jake <laughs> said, my, produ- my supervising producer, Jake Morecambe said we couldn't put in because it was too raunchy. <laughs> this is false. <laughs> I would encourage. <laughs> he said that people would listen to it while they were, were driving the and they'd the veer off the road. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There was no, there was no sex scene, unfortunately. Um, the answer is, un- is unfortunately, um, uh, or, or fortunately, history. Um, I think that there was an earlier version of the episode that I had written that had a extremely dense description of the fall of the Soviet Union that contextualized a little bit about what I told you earlier about why Oleg Kalugin came to write the book. Um, I watched earlier in this year, there's a, a great BBC documentarian and Adam Curtis who relies on archive and um, possibly his most um, typical documentary, the most typical documentary of his style yet um, is a seven hour, well, it's in like hour long s- sequences, um, but it's like seven hours of different bits of archive chronicling the fall of the Soviet Union from 1985 to 1999. Um, and it's got no narration. So it's like... So it's just archive sewn together. Yeah, it's sl- it's like slow cinema. And, and it's incredible. Like some of the some of the stuff is just amazing because it's um, a, like as as Soviet as the Soviet Union fell, um, there was a, a an an American economic idea called um, shock therapy. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Like where it would be like rather than an incremental transition towards towards capitalist democracy, it was like go hard, go fast. So not only had the state fallen, um, and this is not a state like. Australia in 2023, where people maybe relate to Australia in different ways, um, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously. It was like in the Soviet Union, the state was everything. It was absolutely um, the center of people's lives. It was in many ways God. And then in the space of two years, that entire thing just fell away. It just it just disappeared. And then as that's happening. Not, not like you're getting this extremely intense um, uh, experiment in trying to create capitalism really fast, really hard from that. And um, and as a consequence of that, oligarchs are moving in. There's a huge financial crisis, economic crisis that lasts for years. There's mass poverty. I mean, it's just, to me, it's just, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's almost unimaginable. It's um, this storm of, of 
crazy factors. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm, I'm really like interested in this, this idea and the, the reason I kind of love this long form of journalism is I love how like little individual lives get caught up in the mass sweeps in these mass sweeps of human history. And I felt like the Kalugan situation was a sort of example of that. It wouldn't uh, have happened at any other time. It wouldn't have happened at any other time, but it's also like, you know, what was that like for him? And what was that like for the Soviet diplomats or even ca- some of them who were using, who were actually KGB spies under diplomatic cover stayed throughout the world in Canberra in Australia and they're just like watching not only their country but the whole system that they'd used to create meaning in their lives just crumble and being completely uncertain about the future and um and yeah anyway and so, so this I, concept all just ended up on the cutting room floor um well no is that Jay? Yeah. Jay, was it? yeah see that was five minutes of that that's why it's on the cutting room floor but i would say as producer Are please you... more explicit sex in the future yeah 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 no so you it know, wasn't he's, a he's gonna cut this question yeah yeah probably yeah. no 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 but, no, but, went, no, went, no. <laughs> but 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 no but i would say it is uh it is is it, it's it's definitely a good thing because there are many uh, tr- tremendous tellings of the fall of the soviet union and i would mm. encourage people to reach out of them reach out for them that adam curtis documentary is a great place to start it's called trauma zone um but but yes like the focus of the podcast is that we're on a mole hunt and i i'm gr- re- extremely grateful that to to my pr- producers it sounds like i'm living in an autocracy no but i'm extremely grateful to, to to jake that you know that we don't get so ridiculously bogged down in this stuff that um can become a little bit navel gazy yeah um and uh and, 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 you know, so it means that we're, we're left with a product that has um, kind of pace. It's got yep. pace and excitement. Doesn't get bogged and, down and, in the history. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. But anyway. Well recovered. Um, <laughs> so we've got a listener question next from Sandy. Hey, Joey. I just want to know if you're worried that you won't be allowed to enter Russia after releasing this podcast. Good question. Um. <laughs> Russia is an extremely complicated situation. I think it would be currently very unlikely before I had re- released this podcast that I would be able to get into Russia. I think it's very difficult for Westerners and especially Westerners who are journalists to get visas to Russia um, in the current context. I would probably have to pull in some favors that I don't immediately have at my fingertips. Is that your understanding mm. as well? Mm. Um, I haven't heard of any Western journalists, or I have heard of some, but only in very specific cir- circumstances of journalists getting in and out of Russia. Like, um, Following on then from Sandy's question, would you like to go to Russia one day, even if it's not right now? Yeah, I'd, of course. I would absolutely love to go to Russia. It would be uh, so extremely Putin, cool. if you're listening... Yeah. Joey would like to come to Russia. Putin, if you're listening, that, that's a Donald <laughs> Trump line. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But also like the situation in Europe right now is so volatile and the situation in Russia seems so volatile and something must give way at some stage. And I think that over the next few years, um, we're going to see extraordinary changes and who knows, who knows what the map of Europe will look like in three years, let alone five years, let alone 10 years. So I'm, it's true. I'm confident that I will be able to go to Russia and maybe when I do, it'll be in a different social or political context and I'll be able to find answers to some of the unresolved questions that still float above this podcast series. Maybe there's a future series. <laughs> yeah. In Russia. Um, uh, look, and now next episode, episode three, can you give us a little taster of what we can expect? Uh, yes. So um, Swamp. one of the things that Swamp told me um, and that has become clear over the course of making this series is that the KGB were extremely interested in Australia. They sent very, very, very competent intelligence officers to Australia. And that left me with a sort of question of why, why what was so important. Um, the main enemy for the Soviet Union was the US and the UK was a sort of secondary enemy. And then there was Europe and, you know, we're kind of this island on the other side of the world and i wanted to know you know it was a very small population and i wanted to know um why and i heard that the answers to that question or i might start to find answers to that question uh, in a very small town that was built in the middle of the australian desert about six hours six or seven hours north of adelaide and that's where i'm going road trip Mm -hmm. excellent can't wait thanks claire I could kill you quite easily, but I don't, because I'm not a killer. 
was banging on the door, and the first thing he said, where are the documents? Do you want to know more? So that's it today for Nest of Traders Declassified, where we went behind the scenes on episode two. Yep. The uh, real deal, the the real thing is in your podcast feed. You just got to search secrets we keep, Nest of Traders, wherever you get your podcasts. And then you can put that in your ear holes and listen to that. So if you enjoyed today's chat and you want to hear more like this, like this video, subscribe to our channel and leave some comments below. And five stars. Give the podcast five stars. Thanks. I'm not desperate, but it'd be great. Your ear holes. I didn't, I don't think you said ear. ear. I think you said you put it in your holes. <laughs> Listener.